Good evening again, church family. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the epistle of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Tonight we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11 in 1 John 4. So once you turn there, I'll give you just a second, and then we'll pray and we'll ask for God's Spirit to reveal these truths through our heart. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask You to please help us to understand these truths. I want to ask You to not, not only to help us to understand them intellectually, but please help us to understand these things spiritually. Father, I know that the only way that we can have this love from one another, for one another is if it comes from You. And Father, I want to ask that You would work these truths into our hearts. Father, by Your Holy Spirit, please help us to love one another. And Father, help us to hear Your Word tonight. Help us to submit our lives to it in a way that you would be glorified among your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So to begin our time together this evening, I want to start by asking a question. What is the primary distinction between a Christian and a non-Christian? What is the primary distinction between a Christian and a non-Christian? Well, the answer to that is love. The answer to that question is found in several places in the Bible, but the key mark that distinguishes a true born-again Christian and someone who has not been born again by the Spirit of God is the fruit of love. And like I said, we see that over and over again in the Scriptures. If, if you looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'd see Paul say that if someone speaks in the tongues of men or angels or has all prophetic powers and all knowledge and all faith, and if someone gives away everything he has, but that person does not have love, Paul says he is nothing. Paul says that the greatest gift that a Christian has been given and the greatest gift that he can offer is his love. Take a second and flip with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. John chapter 13. And I want us to see the teachings of Jesus here. In John 13, it's one of my favorite passages in the, in the Scriptures. The Lord Jesus gets down and He washes His disciples' feet. And when He does this, He shows them just how great His love is for them and He serves them. He serves them in the most humble way. And then this is what He says. Look at verse 34 and verse 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In those two verses, Jesus says, love one another three times. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the key distinguishing mark of a Christian. So when we come to the passage back in 1 John that we're in this evening, we don't have to wonder where John gets this teaching from. He gets this teaching straight from the lips of the Lord Jesus. Because John was there when Jesus put a towel around his waist and he bent down and he washed John's feet. And John was there shortly after that when Jesus exhorted them to love one another. So when we get to 1 John and we see this commandment to love one another, we see John carrying forward the exact same teaching to the church that he had heard from Jesus many years before. 
If you look back with me to 1 John chapter 4, let's start in verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. This isn't just a casual suggestion for us whenever it's convenient for us. This is a command inspired by the Holy Spirit. Today, we are commanded to love one another. And this commandment to love one another, this is really just Christianity 101. It's simply who we are. It's simply who we must be as God's people. Remember what Jesus said, the way that others will know that you are His disciple is by your love for one another. We are distinguished from every other person, every other, every, every other people group in the world. We're distinguished by our love for one another. And that's, that's a very distinguishing mark between Christians and non-Christians. And look, look what verse 7 and 8 says. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. According to this passage, there are two types of people in the world, and the line is drawn very straight. There are those who love in God's church and have been born of God, and there are those that do not love outside of God's church. There are Christians who are loving one another, and then there are non-Christians or unbelievers who do not love. The fruit of love, according to John, draws a very distinct line, a very clear line. It's not a fuzzy line at all. It's not fuzzy at all because he can say those who love know God, those who don't love do not know God. John doesn't leave any room at all to assume that there are born-again Christians who do not love their brothers and sisters in the church. If they are true Christians, they love God's people. If the fruit of love is not there, John just concludes they do not know God. That's a very explicit statement. Think about that with me a second longer. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. Well, as I was studying this, it, it led me to the question, are unbelievers incapable of loving one another? Are unbelievers incapable of love? And I think the answer to that question is, is yes and no. After all, all people are born with somewhat of a knowledge of God, and because they're made in the image of God, and because of His common grace to humanity, they were born with a capacity to love and to serve others, just not in the same way that Christians understand and know love. All people are able to love to some extent, and that's an important clarification that I think that we would do well to be reminded of often. We often talk about total depravity around here, and we never need to confuse the doctrine of total depravity with the doctrine of utter depravity. So I don't think this verse is teaching us utter depravity, that people are utterly depraved. Are unbelievers totally depraved in their sin? Absolutely. But total depravity does not necessarily mean that someone is utterly depraved, or it doesn't mean that they are as totally depraved as they possibly could be. There's obviously a difference in, I want you to think maybe of a man who has spent his whole life at running an orphanage and loving and giving his life to others, but this man doesn't know Jesus. Well, there's obviously a little bit of a difference in that man and Osama bin Laden. A man who runs an orphanage his whole life and doesn't repent and believe in the gospel, he's just as eternally damned as a man like Osama bin Laden. But the doctrine of total depravity doesn't always mean that someone is totally as totally depraved as he possibly could be. Because of God's common grace, all people are made in His image and have the capacity to love, but they don't love in the same way that Christians love. If, you're a, if you are with a Buddhist family in, in Thailand, is a mother capable of loving her baby? Yes, she is. But it's not the same kind of love that we see here. It's not the same kind of love that we see here that Christians know because it's been given to them by God. So in 1 John, what's the difference in the love of believers and unbelievers? Because remember, John doesn't leave a fuzzy line. It's, not, it's very clear, it's very distinct, it's very straight. The text says that those who are believers love and know God. Those who are not 
believers do not love and they do not know God. So what's so specific about the love of believers? And the answer is found right there in verse 7. It's easy to overlook, but we don't need to overlook it. Every word here is important. It says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. This love is from God. The kind of love that we are called to pursue is not one that we can muster up on our own. It's not one that just naturally bubbles up out of us. It's a love that is produced by the Spirit of God in a believer. This is the type of love that John's talking about. It's a love from God for God's people. And I'm so thankful that when the Spirit of God wrote this down for us, He didn't do it in a way that was abstract or unspecific. When he writes, love one another, he doesn't leave it undefined. The love that he's talking about is not a fuzzy feeling. It's not a cliche word. It's a specific type of love that begins with God and it comes from God. And what we see is John uses the next several verse and he explains the meaning and the motivation of Christian love. It helps us understand the type of love that we're called to pursue and the type of love that we are commanded to give one another. I'm sure all of us at some time or another have heard the word agape. It's one of the words that it's translated from the Greek to English, and it means love. If you started in verse 7, and you went for the next 17 verses, you would end up in in chapter 5, verse 3. In the next 17 verses in 1 John, he uses this word agape over 30 times. So it's safe for us to say, if he's using this word over 30 times in the next 17 verses, the Spirit of God wants us to know something about love in this passage. The Apostle John wants us to know that if we're going to have even a hint of understanding this love, we have to know where it comes from. In this text, we see where that love love comes from. The love that we are called to give to one another originates in God Himself. It originates in God. That's why He says, God is love. God is love. This is one of the greatest statements I think that we can find in the Bible. God is love. We need to see the distinction. Love is not God, but God is love. Love is not It's not an abstract force or a feeling that we can take and we can relate it to who God is. No, love is an attribute of who God is. It flows out of who He is. The reason that we can understand what love is is because it's an attribute that just flows out of the character of God. The reason that we understand love is because God is love. So what we know of love, we know because it's an attribute of His holy character that He's allowed us to get a grasp of and understand. There's another reason why unbelievers have somewhat of a capacity to love and understand love is because if you look at Romans 1, you remember the part of Romans 1 where he's talking about all people having a general revelation or a general understanding of God. And this is where that verse comes. This is where that verse or where that teaching comes from, if you, if you look at Romans 1, it says, For His invisible attributes, like His love, have been clearly perceived since the creation of the world. So everyone has somewhat of an extent of a knowledge of love because they're born with a general revelation or a, a general knowledge of who God is. Everyone is somewhat under, able to understand love because It's an attribute of God that's clearly perceived by all people from the creation of the world. But there's a very big difference in the love of the world and the love of believers. As believers, we have a deeper understanding of this love because we truly understand who God is. We have a deeper understanding of this love because we've understood love unto salvation through the gospel. For believers... We're not able, we're not only able to perceive his invisible attributes, like Romans 1, we are also able to perceive his manifest attributes, what he has actually done among us. And you say, Where are you getting that from? I'm getting it from right here in 1 John. Look at verse 9. In this, 
the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. How have we seen this love manifest among us? Where do we see this love? Why do we understand love in a way that unbelievers don't understand love? Where did we get that from? Right here. It's manifest among us. In this, the love of God was manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. We have seen and we have understood love in so much more in so much more of a significant way because we've seen the Son of God, Jesus, who came to save us. This is the difference in the love of believers and unbelievers. The love of believers is motivated by the gospel. The love of believers is different because we've understood the gospel and that helps us to genuinely love one another in a way that is motivated by the gospel. We understand that the gospel is the ultimate demonstration of God's love. If you look at verse 10 in this passage, in this is love, not that we have loved us, but that he, not, I'm sorry, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. When we start out that verse, we need to really pay attention to the first phrase, in this is love. That's another one of those phrases that as we read through it, we might just be tempted just to, just to skip over it. In this is love. Okay, keep going. No, but we think about this phrase. In this is love. We need to give attention to those words because what he's saying is, in this is love. This is love right here. Do you want to know what love is? Look right here. I'm about to tell you. And I think that's important because in the society that we live in, I think the word love could be the most confused word in, the, in modern vocabulary at all. We use this word flippantly sometimes. We say that we love our spouses. We say that we love our children. And then if you're like me, you turn around and you say, I love donuts. I use that word flippantly. We use that word flippantly. The world uses it even more flippantly and really messes up the definition of love. One of the most popular phrases that I've heard is, Love is love. A lot of people will take words like that and they'll, they'll twist it and make it fit what they want to do with it. Uh, a lot of people use that phrase, love is love, to say that homosexuality should be accepted. People will twist the word of love to make it fit whatever they want it to fit. If you type in love on Wikipedia, this is the definition it gives. It says, love encompasses a range of strong and positive emotional and mental states. From the most sublime virtue or good habit, the deepest interpersonal affection to the simplest pleasure. That's what Wikipedia says about love. Needless to say, there are many, many definitions of love. But what does God say about love? If we want to see the correct definition of love, I think, I think this passage tells us plainly. So let's look and see what it says. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. We need to understand that the truest and the ultimate display of love happened on the cross. This is the truest love. This is the truest love because it's the ultimate demonstration of God's love to us. That we were dead in our sins. We were disobedient rebels. We we deserved eternal damnation under God's wrath. But out of His love, He gave His perfect Son to take the punishment that we deserved. He was the propitiation for our sin and Jesus was killed in our place. That is love. When we look at verse 10, notice what the verse says. We'll go a little bit further. He says, in this is love, not that we have loved God. Let's not skip over that phrase either. It would be easier to read that and say, okay, in this is love, not that we have loved God, and just try to get on to the substance of what he's saying. But we need to understand, in this is love, not that we have loved God. John includes that because he wants us to understand that God's love to us is not transactional and it's not merited by us. When I go to the store and I buy a loaf of bread, I'll give them a few dollars, they'll give me a loaf of bread. 
It's transactional. I give them what they need to stay in business, money. They give me a loaf of bread. What I need, food. Well, everybody gets what they need in that situation. But God's love for us is not the same way as a transactional relationship that we, we understand that we do when we do business. God's love for us is the opposite of transactional. God does not need us. God does not need our love. He does not have to love us. He doesn't owe us anything. We didn't love Him in a way that would cause Him to love us back. No, it was actually quite the opposite of that. We were disobedient. We tried to push Him away. And when we pushed Him away in our sin, He pursued us. He sacrificially gave His Son to die on the cross in the place of people who were rebelling against Him and pushing Him away. He gave us an understanding of His great love to us by giving His Son Jesus to propitiate our sin, to turn His wrath away and to satisfy His wrath in our place. That is love. That He sacrificed His most treasured Son to bear our wrath. So do you want to understand what true love is? The one and only way for you to understand true love is if you understand the gospel. That's why John can draw this line so clearly here. Verses 7 and 8, those who do not love do not know God. Those who do love know God. Unbelievers can't understand love in the same way because they don't have a grasp on the gospel that God sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. True love is originated in God Himself and it's been manifested to us in the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of His Son Jesus. So if you're listening to this this evening, especially if you're watching this tonight, and you've never experienced the grace and the love of Christ, if you've never experienced His love for you, I want you to know for certainty that that love is available to you. And if you'll turn from your sin, if you'll turn from yourself, and you'll trust in His great love for you that He died in the place of your sin, He will forgive you, and He will give you true life and love. You will experience the truest love for all of eternity. There's no greater love than the love that God gives us in His Son, Jesus Christ. No greater love. So now that we understand a little bit about what love is from these verses, let's look at, the, let's look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. He comes right back to where he began with his exhortation in the beginning. He started verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. Then he talks about the gospel, and then he comes back to, Beloved, let us love one another. If God has loved us, we ought also to love one another. What that tells us is that if we're going to love one another, as John has commanded us here, we have to understand the gospel. We cannot love one another if we don't understand what Jesus has done for us. Another way that we cannot love in the exact same way that God has loved us is that we can't love by giving anything or anyone to be a propitiation for someone's sin. We can't do anything to give for redemption. But from the love of God that we've seen in the verses above, we do see that true love is sacrificial, and it's serving, and it's giving, even when and especially when it's not transactional. True love that we see here is John's commanding us and exhorting us to love one another. We need to understand that our love for one another doesn't have to be transactional. True love is never motivated by what I can get out of it. True love is about serving the needs of others even when you don't get anything from them in return. True love is about giving what you do have even and especially when it's precious to you especially when it's precious to you. This is what true love is. If it's your time, if it's your patience, if it's your forgiveness, if it's your possessions, if it's your money, if it's things that you have, whatever it is, the point of this passage is that if God has manifested His love to us by giving the most precious gift, His Son, what on earth could we ever justify holding back from one another? Because we've been shown the greatest love in the gospel, we must be changed to love one another in the same way. 
And I, I think we should stop here and pause for a second. I just want to make a point of application here. You can't love one another in the way that this verse has commanded us to love one another if you don't have other people to love in your life. You can't love people you don't know. John's not writing this to a bunch of individuals. John didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write this one to this person, and then I'm going to write this one to this person. No, John wrote this to a church. You can't love people that you don't know. He's writing to local churches, and what is assumed here is that all Christians will have true fellowship with a church enough to be able to love one another in the way that he's commanded. The Bible never even hints at the idea of a faithful Christian who's not in good fellowship with a local church. So if you're not involved in a church where you can be obedient to this command to love one another, what on earth are you doing living in such disobedience? It's easy to love when you don't have anybody else except for yourself to love. It's easy to practice love when it's just you and you're just loving yourself. But to be obedient to this command, to love one another, you must be involved in a church enough and to be able to actually practice it, to love one another. I don't think anybody has ever gotten to the end of his life and looked back and said, man, I, so many things I wish I could have done. I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time loving and sacrificing for God's church. I've never heard anybody say that. I doubt I ever will. It's always the opposite. It's always, I wish I would have spent more time loving others and sacrificing for others. So church, give yourself to loving one another today. First of all, because that's what God's Word has commanded us to do. This is who we must be. We must be people that are marked by love for one another. And if we want others to see Christ in us, and we do, Jesus Himself said, the first way that they're going to see that is your love for one another. They're going to look at us and say, well, there's something different about them. And that's the kind of church that we ought to be. It's the church that, we, that I've seen so many times over and over again that this church is. But we always need to strive to be, obedience to, this command, to be obedient to this command to love one another. I was thinking about this, and a lot of people will think, well, because I don't have any certain kind of position or I'm not, you know, I'm not in any kind of leadership position, I don't, you know, might not have to be obedient to this in the same way. But every single person that is a part of the church that has been born again has been seated in Christ and in His love. And because of His love, you are commanded to take care of your brothers and sisters, no matter if you have a position or not, no matter if you're a Sunday school teacher or not, no matter who you are. It is your responsibility, if you've experienced the love of Christ, to give that love away. To give that love to one another. And as we look at this and as we think about this, we need to understand that that love doesn't originate in us. Remember where we were in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for our love is from God. It's not something that you can say, I need to do better in this. I just need to muster up a little bit more love and love, love more. That's not what we do here. This is a love that comes from Him. And if you've experienced it through the gospel, it will produce the fruit of love in your life for one another. So our exhortation today, what is it? Here's our exhortation, beloved. Let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God sent His Son as a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Let's pray.